Good evening. My name is Liz Bitzer, and I'm a senior studying public relations in the Brian Lamb School of Communication. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the first PICC Forum of the year, writing for the president when the nation is in a crisis. Our guests tonight are John McConnell and David Cousinet. PICC is a campus-wide nonpartisan initiative for applied learning. This is my third semester with this organization and the opportunities presented under the leadership of our executive director and the friendships I have made with the students in this organization have defined my undergraduate experience. I encourage all students to get involved in PICC because, well simply put, there is no other program that exists like this at Purdue. I would also like to welcome our supporters in the West Lafayette and Lafayette area. It is inspiring the amount of support we receive from Purdue, yes, but also we value our community members. I invite everyone in this room to participate tonight. Pitch your best questions to our guests. We have two roving microphones in the back of the room, Brittany Kalin and Sunny Sun. If you'll raise their hand, they'll come to you and you can ask your questions. And we also have three additional students, Lauren Morton, Kalen Patton, and Benjamin Baker, who are on Twitter. If you prefer to tweet your questions, please tweet Purdue ICC or follow the instructions on your program. Thank you. Hello and good evening. I am Jenny Jackson, a senior studying public relations in the Brian Lamb School of Communication. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce one of our special guests, John McConnell. Mr. McConnell served as a White House speechwriter in the Bush-Cheney administration, helping both the president and vice president with their major addresses, including President Bush's speech to the joint session of Congress after the attacks of 9-11. He held the titles of vice um, of deputy assistant to the president and assistant to the vice president. He also helped draft the eulogies for President Reagan and remarks after the loss of space shuttle Columbia. He has served as a resident fellow at the Harvard University Institute of Politics and chairman of the Gerald R. Ford Journalism Prize for distinguished reporting on the presidency. Let's welcome John McConnell. Good evening. My name is Sarah Richard. I'm from Oak Park, Illinois, and I'm a senior in the Brian Lamb School of Communication, majoring in public relations. I'm honored to introduce David Kuznet. Currently, he serves as senior wordsmith for Podesta Group, an influential lobbying and communication firm in Washington, DC. You may know him from his appearances as an expert commentator on CNN, C-SPAN, and MSNBC. You may have read one of his four successful books, or maybe if you're from the East Bronx area, you recognize him as the young high school student who traveled door to door pestering homeowners to buy aluminum cleaner. <laughs> Chances are, more than anything else, you're familiar with the words that he has written for President Bill Clinton, especially during the nation's economic crisis of the early 1990s. If you heard President Clinton's first inaugural address, then in a way, you know David Kuznet. Please join me in welcoming him and our moderator, Ambassador Carolyn Curiel. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Let's see, is my mic working? It is. Uh, we're excited at having our first event of the school year. Uh, and I want to first also acknowledge, uh, in addition to our guests, we have very important people here who happen to be our students. Students, would you raise your hands if you're PICC? These are the students that put on the event tonight. Let's thank them. <laughs> also interesting is that these two gentlemen serve on our PICC advisory team. And we have one other member of our team here, Hugh Totten, who uh, drove down today from La Valparaiso. So we're delighted to have them with us. Um, I want to open this discussion today with a question for each of our gentlemen. It's a little bit of a double-barreled one. We've been hearing a lot about authenticity, right, on the campaign trail. It was David Brooks, the New York Times columnist, who went a little bit further in defining it in a column recently that was entitled The Formation of Joe Biden. <laughs> 
It was about what forms character. And he pointed to the interview that was done with Stephen Colbert. And I know you two gentlemen have seen it. It was all over the internet. If you missed it, you should go back and watch it. It was quite good. Um, the formation of character referring to what it is that shapes a person. For Joe Biden, it was personal tragedy, um, an accident that took his wife and daughter, and the recent death of his son, Beau. The idea of formation also applies to speech writers as well. You bring something to the table when you're cobbling the words that the president or the vice president will utter. And the formation of his character is important as well because it informs how a president is perceived and also how he or maybe she will communicate during crisis. So apropos of tonight's theme, I want each of you to talk about what it is that formed you and how it is that your president was formed and how you communicated using that formation to the American people. And David, since you have the seniority here as having written for Bill Clinton as chief speechwriter, we'll start with you. And you're actually OK doing it from your chair, David. OK, okay good. Sometimes when I give talks, I prepare at least notes for myself so I can share in the experience of the people I work for and try to read for or improvise from a text and get, just get a better sense of what it is that speechwriters put their, their clients through. Before I try to answer Carolyn's question, I'm going to ask you a question of my own. How many people here? seeing all these former presidential speechwriters up on the stage, think you'd like to do that yourself someday. someday. Ooh, we got some live ones here. <laughs> Good. Now, I, I get asked that a fair amount of what someone needs to do in order to prepare themselves and position themselves for working as a presidential speechwriter. And pretty much I can give either a 10-minute answer or a one-minute answer. The one-minute answer is work in a winning presidential campaign. <laughs> and you'll, you'll be in a position to work for the president once he or she is elected. That's the route that, that I took. And in answer to Carolyn's question, I'm going to briefly tell you what that route was. And it's a route that's much clearer in hindsight than it was in foresight, because when I was doing all these things, I had very little idea of where they were going to lead. You can tell that Carolyn must have been a great journalist when she was a journalist, because she's managed to ask me a, a question that, as Joe Biden would say, literally, literally nobody <laughs> has ever asked me that question before of what formed, what, what formed my character. So just trying, you know, at, at my advanced age, just trying to tentatively answer that question and being reminded that quite a long time ago I was going door to door in the Bronx trying to sell people aluminum cleaner that they probably didn't need for their aluminum doors. I'm thinking that like that, you know, everyone's from somewhere. And where I'm from is Brooklyn, New York. Now, this morning on the plane coming here, I was reading the Wall Street Journal, and there was a headline on the front page, how does Paris stay chic? And the answer it has in the headline is by importing things from Brooklyn. <laughs> now, I think it's fair to say that when I was growing up, Paris did not stay chic by importing things from, from Brooklyn. I grew up in a middle-income housing development in Brooklyn that was across the street from low-income housing projects. And as speech writers, we're very attuned to words. And one word, one verbal pattern that I learned very young is if middle-income people lived somewhere in New York City in the 1960s, they called it a development. If low-income people lived somewhere, they called it a project. And we were, once again, as Joe Biden would say, literally across the railroad, the ele an elevated line from the low, various low-income housing projects. 
they were, and growing up, I, and as a college kid, I had very good educational opportunities, but I also got to experience a New York City that had people with very different kinds of opportunities. The people who lived in the projects, the retired very garment workers and civil servants who lived where I was growing up, many of whom in retirement would sit on the benches in the development and talk about the world and sound very much both in accent and viewpoint like, Joe, like Bernie Sanders sounds. And I got, I got a sense of an America that was a place of opportunity, but it was also a place where people had very different opportunities or lack of opportunities. As Bill Clinton likes to say, talent is universal, but opportunity isn't universal. And I think that plus the ferment of the 1960s sort of gravitated me towards progressive politics. And at lunch, Carolyn and I, and I think some others, were reminiscing about the public figure of the 1960s, the political leader of the 1960s, who probably best embodied those values in part because his promise was cut short. And Carolyn, and she may talk about it later, was talking about when Robert Kennedy campaigned mm -hmm. here in Indiana. I remember seeing Robert Kennedy campaigning in New York when he was a senator from New York in the Albee Square in downtown Brooklyn. He was there with President Johnson campaigning for some long forgotten and losing New York candidate for governor. And I remember even then a lot more people came to see Robert Kennedy than came to see President Johnson. And I think for both Carolyn and me, well, we may both talk about it, that one of the, some of the high points of our working for President Clinton was when we had each other the opportunity to write speeches about the memory and the legacy and the ideals of Robert Kennedy. Now, while I admired Robert Kennedy and some other leaders, I never imagined myself going into politics or working for politicians. I wanted to be a writer. After college, I worked in suburban newspapers in New York and, and Connecticut. And I remember at one of those papers, it was a Friday afternoon, and there were some people came into the newsroom. And they weren't the usual kinds of people coming to newsrooms. What came into newsrooms in the early 70s, which was either like official looking people in suits or some of the eccentric people who were going to tell you that their UFOs had landed in next door to them or something. These were people who looked very unhappy dressed in their working clothes. And they were people who had been laid off from a school lunch program. And covering the story of what had happened to them, I got, was in touch with the union that represented those workers, which was AFSCME, American Federation of State County Municipal Employees. And about that time, a friend of mine was heading up the AFSCME organizing campaign in Illinois. And she asked me if I wanted to come work for them. And for some reason, I said yes, and spent several years with a working around the state of Illinois, headquartered in, in Springfield, the state capital, then came back to Washington and found myself writing speeches for the national president of the union. And among other things, I wrote two national press club speeches. And those were the, this was in the late 70s, those were the days before databases, but there were, I don't know, does anyone here remember the Rolodex? There were Rolodexes, and that got me into the Rolodex of being a Democratic Party speechwriter. And in 1979, I got a call from a man named Marty Kaplan, who was chief speechwriter for then Vice President Walter Mondale. And he asked me if I wanted to try out as deputy speechwriter for Walter Mondale. And for some reason, I said no. Maybe I thought that the Carter, accurately, that the Carter administration was in, in trouble. But I said no. And this is a true fact. The person who was hired instead of me was Charles Krauthammer, who went from writing for a very liberal vice president to becoming a very 
conservative newspaper columnist and television commentator. Then, and here I'll give you like my first pointer, whether it's a life lesson or a career pointer. The day after the 1980 election when President Carter and Vice President Mondale were overwhelmingly defeated, I figured this was the time to reach out to Marty Kaplan, who had contacted me in 1979. I figured he would probably appreciate hearing from somebody. So I called him up and asked him if there's anything I said I really appreciated as having thought of me a year earlier and asked him if there's anything I could do for him. And he was heading for a job first with Walt Disney and then with Walter Mondale in 1984 when Mondale ran for vice president, for, pres for president. So there were, wasn't anything I could do for Marty Kaplan. But sure enough, in 1984, Marty Kaplan called me up and asked me again if I wanted to work for Mondale. And I did, and I was a speechwriter on Mondale's campaign plane for the last three months of the 1984 election, which ended with our carrying Minnesota by several thousand votes and losing every other state and getting the District of Columbia and losing every other state in the country. In 1988, I worked the same stint for Michael Dukakis with a slightly better outcome. We carried 10 states and the District of Columbia. And after that campaign, I figured that, you know, if, def if defeat is the great instructor, Edges with feet is the great educator. I had went to graduate school. <laughs> and I wrote a book called Speaking American about the lessons of those two campaigns and some kind of prescription for how Democrats could address the country better in the years ahead. And the governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton, read that book and hired me as chief speechwriter in for his campaign in 1992. I started in May, it is largely forgotten now, even by people who are political, jun who are political junkies, that in May and June of 1992, Bill Clinton was running third behind the first President Bush, who was running first, and a billionaire maverick named Ross Perot, who was running second and who in some ways calls to mind a, another billionaire who is running for president now. The third time was the charm. President Clinton was, Bill Clinton was elected president, and I had the opportunity to join the ranks of presidential speechwriters. David actually forced me to go work at the White House. That's right. <laughs> How could he do such a thing? How could he do such a thing? That's David, right. I'm, I'm going to ask you to hit the pause button so that we have John catch up okay. with how he ended up at the White House as well. John, go ahead. Uh, well, um, it's uh, 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 really not a long story. I, I come from a small town in northern Wisconsin, very small, 600 people, um, uh, a, a small world uh, for much of my early life. Um, my mom was a beautician. My dad, who died when I was a boy, was in sand and gravel. My stepfather, who raised us, uh, was a carpenter. And um, there was a house full of books. And my dad and stepfather and all of my uncles, practically all of my uncles and my grandfather, had been in the military. Uh, uh, not, not career, but uh, volunteers, in my stepfather's case, drafted. So they had seen a lot of the world. Uh, it was a house filled with books, and my parents were readers. And I was just, from the time I, uh, 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 the, the farthest, the earliest memory I have, I was fascinated with history. And I was just thrilled by the idea that history is not just one thing happening and then another thing happening. History is human beings doing things. And so I just became fascinated with biography. And if you're interested in biography at all, mm -hmm. and you start reading, you get interested in the American presidency. It just kind of happens. So from a very early age, I was fascinated with the presidency and politics and all that comes with it. And um, the largest figure of my upbringing, of course, was Ronald Reagan, <clears throat> became president of the United States when I was a junior in high school and was still president when I was a, a third year in law school, so a very large uh, portion of my life. But he was my boyhood hero. He had been my hero um, 
several years before he became president. I was a little kid. I just, there was something about Ronald Reagan. He was a major public figure, had been governor of California, but at this point he was, he was a former governor. And um, I just thought he was great, and I was very hopeful that he was going to be president someday. And it's easily forgotten. It's almost, it almost feels sometimes like it's lost to history now how controversial that man was in the, 19, the late 1970s when I was a little kid. Um, I can tell you honestly, the majority, the vast majority, super majority of the, the adults I knew, including just about every teacher in the school, thought that I was crazy to think that Ronald Reagan could be president someday. I remember being spoken to in, in, you know, very slowly, Johnny, I know you like Ronald Reagan, <laughs> but Ronald Reagan will never be president of the United States. I was, I was assured of this. Well, imagine what it meant when he was elected president. Um, it was a big thing for me, and it made me an optimist <laughs> for a lifetime. And uh, so I always stayed interested in politics, always thought I would get involved in politics in, in some way. And after law school, uh, clerked for a federal judge in New York, and then immediately, uh, just through good luck and um, uh, 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 a, a, a very nice break uh, from, from uh, the Almighty, uh, found myself uh, as a junior speechwriter at the White House for Vice President Dan Quayle, who is from, of course, this state, served this state as a U.S. Senator for two terms. This is 25 years ago in the uh, summer of 1990. So I kind of fell into it. I was hired on a temporary basis because they didn't really, uh, I had good recommendations. Uh, and I was willing to work for very little money, and that was good enough for them. Um, but I didn't have much experience, and so I was hired on a probationary basis. Um, and then the three months came and went, and I think they forgot to fire me, so I just stayed. <laughs> so you're both in your respective White Houses. Uh, David, yours was an arduous journey. Journalists got involved with a labor organization, uh, got notice. Uh, for your writing skills, worked uh, for uh, Dukakis, Mondale, versus that, and was able to catch the attention of a governor who Bill Clinton read everything. Every book I think ever published on planet Earth, <laughs> he had read. So yours stood out to this man and caused him to call you and offer you a job on his campaign, leading to your going to the White House. What was it that connected the two of you? So the question of formation. Something was being formed with David Kuznet. Something was formed with uh, Bill Clinton. He saw something in you that could communicate for him. That, again, that's a question no one's, no one's asked me. It's on, on paper, we're very different people, Clinton from the border, from Arkansas, me from the Northeast. I think, more important than what he might have seen in me is what I saw in him. What I saw in him was a capacity to bridge divides in this country. Someone who could talk to very different audiences and say the same thing substantively but find some way to speak to the heritage and the humanity of very different audiences. And I think that what Clinton was looking for in staff and advisors and supporters as he prepared to run in 1992, after a 12-year period when the Democratic Party had lost three presidential elections by very large margins, was some way to learn the lessons of what had happened to the Democratic Party during that period and find some way, as, and he would put it better, that we could hold on to our values but be able to address a very different country from the country that had elected Franklin Roosevelt and John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. And that's what, what I tried to do in that book, Speaking American. And more importantly, that's what a lot of the people around him 
had tried to do. There was a pollster named Stanley Greenberg who studied at great length Macomb County in Michigan, which was a county that had voted overwhelmingly for John Kennedy in 1960 and just as overwhelmingly for Ronald Reagan in 1980 and 1984. It was considered the home of the Reagan Democrats. And there are many other people around President, around candidate Clinton who had thought about such, such things. And I think he tried to put together what he, then what he at that time called a, a new Democratic Party, a different kind of Democratic Party, a party that could speak to America as it was approaching the 21st century, not a party that was mired in, the, in memories of the 1960s and the 1930s. So John, you didn't mention for whom you were working at the White House, did you? Well, Vice President Quayle. Yeah. Vice President Quayle. Now, that name came up in a class earlier today, and immediate recognition was not there. <laughs> zero. But it was zero. It was pretty much zero, it yeah. <laughs> uh, not, not a proudest moment for our Purdue class. That, it was a small class, I got to say. Well, this, um, this was a man who was vice president of the United States almost 27 years ago, and is today younger than the current vice president of the United States. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Maybe he's 41. I did not realize that. Yeah. So you were working for Dan Quayle from the yep. Midwest. You're from the Midwest. Yep. Did that help you at all? And in the formation that you described, the formation of you as a person who really believed in somebody named Ronald Reagan, probably long before a lot of other people did, uh, was that connection there with the vice president? Did you have to create that? Did you see something in him that you saw the formation of Dan Quayle and could relate to it? Well, you know, that's a good question. I liked him very much. I had been a Senate page when I was 16, my Capitol Hill experience. Um, and Senator Quayle, I remember, I remember liking him a lot, relating to him uh, uh, on some level, I guess, probably Midwestern, uh, all of that. Uh, and he, he had come in with Reagan as a senator, kind of an unexpected uh, senator. And so when I went to work for him, I ended up working for him for seven years, two years as vice president, five as a former. And we got along very well. I mean, just, uh, um, I didn't, uh, 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 we were on a very, a very, uh, very similar wavelength, I guess I would say. Um, I could, I, I learned pretty fast how to write for him. Um, he was a very good writer himself. He had a newspaper background. He could write fast, which I can't do. Um, but uh, I transitioned from him to George W. Bush at the end of the 1990s, the turn of the century, um, uh, and went to Texas to work for Bush. He was the governor, second term governor, but he had transitioned into a presidential um, uh, So you follow campaign. the Kuznet rule. Yeah, when you, you choose a governor who's going to be elected president. That's how you become a presidential speechwriter. But, uh, Clinton chose David, read his book, chose him. George W. didn't have any idea how, who I was. Uh, I was hired on the say-so of Mike Gerson and Matthew Scully, who were the other two speechwriters already hired in there in Austin. And they were the ones uh, uh, um, uh, that I joined with uh, to make our three-person team that did all the major speeches through the campaign and then through the, um, through the first term. Um, Bush was interesting, just you talk about formation. This is the, the, the second time in American history where you have a president whose father was president. And so he not only knew the White House, had not only been the White House, he knew every inch of it, probably had slept there a hundred times um, uh, in his life. His father was Ronald Reagan's vice president for eight years. And Bush himself had met seven other presidents who served before him. And so one thing that impressed me always was the man was utterly lacking in pretense. He just did not, he, 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 he did not carry the presidency as some heavy, uh, uh, shiny object. Um, he, he, he wore the title lightly. He always treated people as equals. And I think it perhaps had something to do with having been exposed to uh, the presidency uh, to the degree that he had. Um, uh, in speeches, the first words that he would cross out would be my, me, or I. He just didn't want to talk about himself. That was also his father's reputation. Yeah, yeah. And um, so 
there would be entire speeches where he never made reference. And he, if, he would, if there would be a sentence in a speech that said, you know, I am here today to do thus and so, he would, he would read that and go, of course I'm here. <laughs> and it's the first thing he would take out of a, of a speech draft. Um, or if, um, there's nothing wrong with this if you had in a speech uh, just a line, I, I, as I mentioned a moment ago, mm -hmm. George W. Bush could get to a line like that and said, well, why am I saying it again? <laughs> Take it out. He, did, he, didn't want, he didn't want these existential references to the fact that he's here or to the fact that he just said something. He just didn't want anything like that. Um, he wanted speeches that had uh, momentum, that weren't over, overly burdened with uh, 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 excess material. He didn't mind giving a long speech. And he, he wanted to add things. He, he, he wanted detail, and he didn't want to skip logical steps. He wanted to explain things. Um, but by the same token, he, just, he, he, he was a very good editor. Uh, he could pare something down. Um, he could also read a speech once, a draft that he'd never seen before, eight pages, read it once, put it down on his desk, look up at the ceiling, and recite to you the outline of the speech. He could internalize the organization of the speech, um, which is something I can't do. I can't read something once and give you the outline. Uh, but he could do that, and he had a real, a, just he could internalize uh, the structure of something. And so if a speech didn't have a clear outline, he would, he would lose confidence in it and lose interest in it very fast. So he made better writers of us by, by really, really pushing us to organize the thoughts and, um, and to be clear. He edited for clarity all the time. Two very different presidents, obviously. Um, David, as you know, the Clinton bio was oftentimes incorporated into his speeches. The formation of Bill Clinton was right. kind of incorporated in. I don't think that was the case for George W. Bush, was it? Uh, his personal biography um, as part of his uh, uh, body of, of speeches. No, that's true. He really, he didn't, it just wasn't, he just didn't do it as, as his story. Let's go to questions from the audience, from our students. I know we have a lot of Twitter questions as well. Oh. Um, Mike Rovers, do you have anybody? Hands up if you want somebody with a roving mic to come to you. Uh, otherwise, let's go to a Twitter question. Uh, yes, Rebecca Bruni asks, could you share your thoughts about how Hillary Clinton has handled speaking to the press about this server issue? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> That's almost not fair since neither gentleman has ever written for Hillary Clinton. Um, so, But you both know her. We, I think I... Was she in the White House? So. <laughs> Let's go to another question. Um, I was wondering what you found the difference was between writing on the campaign trail and writing in the White where, House. Where are you? Who's, who's speaking? I'm right here. here. Oh. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, did you get that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just chime in here. And the, and the campaigns, uh, the, uh, campaigning and governing are two very different things. Um, <sighs> Uh, for, for, for obvious reasons. In campaigns, it's about laying out the choice facing the voters and laying out the differences between, at least between the candidates, perhaps between the parties. Uh, uh, it, 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 when you're not campaigning and governing, you won the election. Now it's about unity, common ground, bringing people together, not, not sharpening uh, 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 the differences as you do in a campaign. That's why campaigns can be more fun sometimes, because the speeches are always, they always have a little bit of an edge to them. I couldn't do it for eight years in a row. I could do, I could do the governing part for eight years in a row. But campaigns, they have a certain intensity and drive to them that I just, um, uh, they end, and mercifully end. Uh, no one ever says, gee, I wish this campaign had just gone on and on and on. <laughs> this doesn't happen. David? I think that's exactly right. I worked in three presidential campaigns before working for a president. And all three of the campaigns were, we were the challenger. We were the party on the outs. We were criticizing the incumbents. 
And then after having worked in those three campaigns, I had the experience of helping to write an inaugural address and then coming in right after the inaugural address was over on the afternoon of January 20th, 1993, walking into the White House for the first time in, in my lifetime and having a very different job of, instead of criticizing things, explaining, explaining things and, and defending things. In a sense, with pre I've, I've had the opportunity to work on the acceptance speech of a candidate running as a challenger, the inaugural address of a candidate, of, of a candidate who had been elected president taking office, and then the joint session, strictly speaking, it's not a State of the Union speech, but the joint set, the first speech to a joint session of Congress by the newly elected president. And in a sense, they're three very different speeches, but they all reflect roles that exist in this country that are somewhat different from other countries. The acceptance speech at a national convention, in effect, by, by a challenging candidate, in effect is his or her assumption of the role of leader of the opposition. The inaugural address is the assumption of the role of head of state, representative of the entire country and not just of one political party. And the State of the Union speech is the assumption of the role of head of the government. Now in Britain, for instance, those might be three different roles. You might have the leader of the opposition is someone who's there long before the election time. The British Labour Party just elected a new leader of the opposition. There's not going to be an election for, I think, four or five years. The head of state in Britain is the king or queen of England, and the leader of government is the prime minister. Here the president is both the head of state and the head of government, which means they have very different rhetoric on different occasions. If you're giving the inaugural address, you're speaking of head of state, you're talking in terms of American values, you're usually not talking in terms of specific programs. I don't think there's ever been an inaugural address that had a dollar figure in it. When you're speaking, giving the State of the Union speech, all of a sudden, you're the head of the government, you're speaking very specifically in terms of government programs their effectiveness, your proposals. And it's a very different kind of rhetoric from being either a candidate or being a newly installed president delivering an inaugural. And one of the challenges for people who do what we did is understanding those different voices, especially if in the course of six months you're having to write in those three different voices. The, voice of the opposition, the voice of the head of state, and the voice of the head of government. The theme tonight, writing in a time of crisis. Uh, John, you're attached to one of a speech that addressed perhaps the biggest crisis we faced. Um, huge attack that included uh, the downing of the two towers, the World Trade Center, uh, attack on the Pentagon, and a plane that went down in a field in Pennsylvania, uh, a day of real terror. Um, those of us who are around then and uh, in and around Washington and New York in particular really felt that day, but it was felt everywhere. And you were in a situation where how long before the joint session to the Congress where you contacted, had you digested what you needed to? Give us a little bit of the background, how you got prepared for that and how that speech was produced? Uh, well, what happened was, uh, um, I was speaking uh, to a class this morning. I was, I was in the White House on 9-11, and I just happened to be sitting alone with Vice President Cheney in his office and we, uh, af after the World Trade Center had been hit in the North Tower. And he and I were just watching the TV as the second plane came in and hit the South Tower. And it became clear that it was a coordinated terrorist attack on the country. We didn't know that there was a plane coming at us at 500 miles an hour at the time, uh, but that became clear soon enough and, and there was an evacuation. Um, didn't get back to the White House until late that night. I had to beg a Secret Service man to let me in the Eisenhower building to get my apartment key. Wow. He said, that building's sealed off, no one going in there. Uh, 
I said, well, I've got to get my apartment key. He said, well, you, you come back to me. I went over there with the light of my um, uh, flip phone <laughs> uh, to find Remember my... Those? Uh, yeah, there were no Blackberries or anything. But, um, anyway, um, so uh, I saw the president the next day, and uh, Mike and Matthew and I were there, and, and, and you know, he told us, obviously, there are going to be some major speeches coming up, including one on Friday at the National Cathedral Memorial Service. But it wasn't until Monday, the 17th, that uh, he decided, I guess tentatively decided, he was going to give a speech to the Congress on the 20th, Thursday. But he wanted a speech draft uh, that day to see um, uh, uh, before a final decision was made. So the short of it is, um, uh, Mike and Matthew and myself had to do a speech draft in one day for an address to Congress, which, as you mentioned, was the largest audience in, in, in human history. Uh, we didn't have a conclusion, I remember. We didn't have it in us to, to write the last two or three paragraphs of the speech. Um, but in a situation like that, you're not lacking for material, you're not lacking for context or anything else. It is a challenge to organize, and I remember that ab about one o'clock after we'd been working for five hours or more, and we had a lot of we had a lot down. Um, we got called to the Oval Office and the President said, well, where are we on this, this speech to Congress? And, and one of us, I'm, I'm sure it was Mike Gerson, said, uh, well, we, you know, we're, we've got a lot, of, a lot down and we're just plow, plowing ahead on this. And that's when the President said, Americans have questions. They want to know who attacked our country. They want to know why they hate us. They want to know how are we going to fight and win the war and what's expected of us now. And that really gave us an organizing construct for the speech. And if you go back and look at that speech, that's what it does. The president, um, after a little bit of scene setting, says, Americans tonight have questions. And then that's the rest of the speech, answering the questions. Um, it was, uh, we had the draft finished on, on, uh, on Tuesday, deliverable on Tuesday. The president did a lot of edits, did a lot of edits on Wednesday. And then Thursday, he came in. The Prime Minister uh, of Britain, Tony Blair, had come into town. And I remember he had a meeting with Tony Blair and a final speech prep. And then he took a nap. And I was really impressed because I thought, you know, he's going to be speaking to an audience of a billion tonight. And I couldn't take a nap, but he can. And uh, that, a man like that should be president. <laughs> uh, and then um, I remember going up in the motorcade and standing on the floor as he delivered that speech. And, uh, and then I was wedged in a car between Karl Rove and the British ambassador. You know, these crazy motorcade rides you have. And that motorcade left the White House to the Capitol. And um, it was as fast as I've ever moved uh, through the streets of a city. We were, in the, we, were, we were in the Capitol building in about a minute and a half. I mean, from the White House. The gates are open, the streets are closed. Washington is dark, it's a scary time, and it was like, being in a slingshot. It was, I mean, the, so, somebody said uh, uh, one time, um, uh, boy, aren't you glad that speech didn't fail? Uh, it was really important. And of course you are, but in truth, a speech like that is not going to fail. All the drama is already there. All the emotion is there. You don't have to figure out how to make the event bigger than it is. You're always doing that as a speechwriter. How do I give this speech some lift? In a situation like that, and as my colleague Matthew Scully pointed out, the only way for a big speech like that to fail in a moment like that is if it's overwritten, if it just wallows in the emotion and tries to just pull too much out of it. it and, and of course, President Bush wouldn't do that. No, would Simplicity be, is what it he would It would not be reflective of him. The uh, moment required simple English. That's all it required. The crisis during the time that Clinton took president was more economic. It was not nearly as dramatic, except for those people that were perhaps suffering horribly economically. So how did you approach that? The big thing was the stimulus package. And then there was something called the health care attempt, the first health care right. attempt under uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, how was all of that managed? Where did you, how did you handle that for Bill Clinton? And how did you insert him into it? To go back what, to what is now almost 25 years ago, President 
Clinton, Bill Clinton won an election that nobody, including except perhaps him, expected at the beginning of that campaign that he would win. The first President Bush had presided over, successfully over the first Gulf War. His going into 1991, the first President Bush's ratings were, I think, as high as any presidents have ever been. And then it seemed that every pent up domestic crisis began to worsen. The economy tanked. There was a national recession where I think at one point there was 7% unemployment. Property values in much of the country declined. The unrest that had happened in the 1960s recurred in Los Angeles. And there was a kind of disillusionment with the political process that's very much like what you see now. A con conservative newspaper columnist and former presidential speechwriter named Patrick Buchanan challenged President Bush for renomination and ran very strongly in the primaries. A billionaire named Ross Perot, who in some ways resembles another billionaire who's running now, was running as an independent and was running first or second in the polls. And Bill Clinton won the nomination in part because he, most of those who were considered the presidential class Democrats at that time, and not, not necessarily in order of importance, Al Gore, Bill Bradley, Dick Gephardt, Sam Nunn, Mario, first and foremost Mario Cuomo, did not run leaving Clinton to run, to enter the campaign very late. He entered it about this time of the year in 1991. And he ran against a very small field, some of whom had not, were, not, were not holding public office at that time. And it was Clinton's view in the campaign and in his first year that there were three crises in America at that time. There was the economic crisis, there was the loss of con and confidence in the political system, and there were the racial and social and cultural divisions in the society, plus social problems like, among other things, the crimes of children killing children, which Carolyn wrote a very moving speech for, the, for President Clinton about in the fall of 1993. And Clinton saw his role as both awakening people to the fact that this were, these were crises. These were situations requiring coordinated national attention and restoring people's faith first in themselves and in each other, that, that Americans as a community and as a country could cope with these crises and restoring some kind of faith in government as an instrument of the national purpose and the national will. And if you read, as you can find online, his acceptance speech at the 1992 convention, his inaugural address, and then a speech that he gave to a joint session of Congress, and I still remember the day, February 17th, 1993, those themes of the triple crisis, the economic crisis, the political crisis, and the social crisis, everything but a national security crisis, were dominant in the message he was trying to convey to the American people. Now, we had a similar kind of one-week run-up to a major speech with that joint session speech in, on February 17th, 1993. Candidate Clinton had run on a pretty detailed economic program, which was published in a mini book called Putting People First, which included a middle class tax cut, some tax increases for the highest income Americans, and public investments in infrastructure and education and technology. Then after the election, as often happens with a change of parties, the departing administration told us 
that the fiscal condition of the federal government was much worse than had been revealed during the campaign. And tax revenues were lower. The federal deficit was higher. And as the president assembled an economic team that included not just the kind of Democrats who work in campaigns, but Democrats from Wall Street and Senator Lloyd Benson, who was the chair, then the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, there was understandable pressure for deficit reduction as well as public investment and the middle class tax cut. So the president's staff working on the speech, speech writers, economic policy people, communications people, had the challenge of writing a speech for an economic program that was being devised right as we were writing that speech. And, it was, and there were similar hmm. other situations in the administration. <laughs> uh, it was very much, there was a time it felt like fly by the seat of the pants. That's right. And, and it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't, I would argue it was not the disorganization of the administration but the uncertainty of the economic and fiscal situation. Things are moving very quickly. And the debate within the administration yeah. between, by way of shorthand, the deficit hawks and the campaign people, and the capacity of the president to understand and be a participant in the policy debates while thinking through in his own mind what he was going to do and how he was going to make the case for it. But the result was we had a number of us, after working pretty much around the clock during the week before February 17th, did an all-nighter the night before, then turned into the president a document that he was not fully satisfied with, both for philosophical reasons and because the policy had continued to evolve while we were drafting the speech, and went through another day of massive revisions in the speech he then went to Capitol Hill to deliver the speech. And the journalists who, using the technologies of the time, compared the advanced text of the speech with the, with the transcript of what the president actually said, found that about 25% of it was improvised. OK, so I just want to point out that none of this did David Kuznet share with me. I was starting at the White House one week later. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thanks, David. So, we, <laughs> we want to go to a Twitter question. Let's not make it one that's political. <clears throat> Pertinent to these gentlemen, please. All righty. So, uh, we actually have a question directed at each of our guests here. Uh, the first one will be directed to uh, Mr. McConnell. Uh, and it says, was it difficult to set aside your own emotions in order to convey to the American people what needed to be said during the 9-11 speech? Um, I don't remember setting aside my own emotions, um, uh, but I, I just remember um, that we had to get the job done. We talked about this yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, when you work for a president, you're often asked, to, uh, how does it feel writing for history? And my answer always was, I have no idea what it feels writing for history. I'm just writing for today. Uh, we've got to get this job done. And if you start thinking in terms of oh, this is a speech that's going to be uh, studied and remembered and quoted for days, weeks, months, generations. If you think anything like that, you're going to freeze up and you're going to become too self-conscious uh, to actually get your job done. So I, um, in 9-11, in I mean, 9-11 was an emotional time for everybody. And so um, I, I don't remember having to... I mean, I, I, I knew two women who were killed that day, but I didn't lose a family member or something like that. I, I wasn't sort of in the thick of the, of the tragedy as, as, as so many others were. Uh, so there wasn't anything that I had to sort of block out of my mind. It just was kind of uh, uh, an emotional period, and, and we all sort of carried that with us. That's the best answer I can give. And the question for Mr. Kuznet is, considering that you are both an author and a speechwriter, what do you think the difference is between conveying a message in a text versus delivering a message orally to a crowd? That's a, that's a very important 
question, and that cuts to the core of the craft that we have all practiced. Speech writing, and this just stands to reason, speeches are meant to be spoken and heard. They are not, even in the era of the internet, they are not meant to be written and read. It's an earlier form of communication. So as you are writing a speech, you have to ask yourself, is, are these words speakable? Can somebody get up in front of an audience and say them in a loud voice? Are they speakable by the speaker you're writing for? Does that speaker have some kind of speech impediment or regional accent, accent or personal quirk that would make it difficult for them to speak those words? And that, in its, that consideration in itself dictates a few things. You don't, while alliteration, you know, beginning every word with the same sound is a good speech writing technique. You don't use the S sound, because even somebody without a speech impediment has trouble making too many S sounds. And if they do, they'll sound more like a snake than like a human being. <laughs> so there are just considerations of making it speakable. The second consideration is making it listenable and understandable. Are you using words that make sense when heard? Are you presenting a flow of argument, an outline, an effect, as mm -hmm. John was saying, of the second President Bush, mm -hmm. so that a listener can follow the logic of what you are saying? And the third consideration, and this is something I, I, I feel very strongly about as a speechwriter. I've heard others who don't. I've read guides to speechwriting that don't even mention this, is that a good speech has an emotional as well as a logical structure to it. The best analogy I give is maybe a sermon you'd hear in church, that I think a good speech begins by establishing common ground with the audience mm -hmm. so that they will listen to you and think you're on a wavelength with them. Then at some point, I think you actually bring people down. You present them with a challenge. You bring them the bad news. You get to the crux of what the problem is that you're addressing. And then you bring them back up. And the important thing then is to bring them up to a higher point than they started with. When you consider what, how a speech is evaluated, it's not, as John was saying, it's not initially for the history books, but it is for that news cycle. And the measure of a speech very often is how the crowd reacts at the end. Do they give you a standing ovation? Do they applaud? I don't think there's ever been a speech in human history that was considered a successful speech if the crowd applauded at the beginning, but not at the end. <laughs> so that, that argues for the emotional structure of starting with common ground, bringing them down, and then bringing them up. And I would suggest to you that as an example of that, you can find online President Clinton's acceptance speech in 1992, where it begins with pretty much his stump speech. Then it goes to a point where he says, and I made these same points at a rally here in Manhattan not long ago, and a man got up and said, and at this point I think the audience is thinking, a man got up and said, go get him, governor, we're going to win. But a man got up and said, but you're, a, but you're a politician. Why should I believe a word you say? So that brings them down. And that's the, un, that's the authentic thing. That's a surprising thing. And the rest of the speech brings them back up again. But it's that point where you su surprisingly bring them down. And I think that should be part of any speech that is intended to get an emotional as well as a rational response from the audience. That was a great primer. On that note, we have to end. Uh, let's thank our guests. And
Ryan, Ryan Zamora will close the show for us. All right, good evening. My name is Ryan Zamora, and I'm from Indianapolis. I will graduate this December with a degree in public relations from the Brian Lamb School of Communication. I hope everyone enjoyed our discussion as much as I did. Let's thank again our two special guests, David Kuznet and John McConnell, and our moderator, Ambassador Curiel. These forums are a great educational experience for the students who participate. If you are a student and you are not involved with the Purdue Institute for Civic Communication, you are missing out on merit scholarships, on Purdue's only class in Washington, D.C., on internship support, on great classes unlike any others at Purdue, and a lot more. Visit our website, purdue.edu slash PICC, for more information. Also, if you're a student getting extra credit for attending this forum, please make sure you get your program stamped and turn it into your professor. So these forums also depend on the participation and attendance of our neighbors in the community as well as on campus. Please help us spread the word for future events which are listed in your programs. Thank you all so much for coming and have a great night. Also, while everybody is exiting, we welcome all the PICC students who helped contribute with this program and forum to join us on stage for a picture with our guests.